Thank you guys so much for joining us today. I am really excited about the topic for today. This quarterly is all about practical Christianity. So we're going to get our hands dirty. It's going to be a fun lesson. My name is Rachel. I'm the Associate Director for the Hebrew Bible Institute. And this is my friend, Eric. He is a church member here with uh, our church at the Edge Christian Worship Center. Eric, thanks for coming today. You're going to help us keep things real, right? Hopefully. Yeah. (laughs) Eric brings a cool outside perspective that we really appreciate. And Pastor Sasha, or shall I say Dr. Sasha, Alexander Bolotnikov, you um, are our resident theologian. You're going to make sure that we keep things super deep and (laughs) super deep. You are the director of the Hebrew Bible Institute, and uh, I don't know what I would do without you, but uh, thank you so much for um, helping us lead our study today. Yeah, yeah, because sometimes people love to go into practical stuff and forget that the Bible has to be the guide for our practice. Yes, 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 yes. The Bible is our guide. So um, with that, Pastor Sasha, um, can you actually start us off on um, Genesis 3, 8 and 9? All right, uh, I'll take a look uh, and just read it from the Hebrew, just side translate. So they heard the voice of the Lord God who was taking a stroll uh, in the garden uh, in the uh, cool of the day uh, and uh, Adam and his wife uh, hid from the presence of the Lord uh, God uh, in, uh, in the midst of the trees of the garden. So, The Lord God calls upon Adam and says, uh, Adam, well, the traditional translation would say, where are you? But (laughs) there is more to it. Yeah, there's more to it. And and, uh, yeah, I know you're dying to get into that. And I'm dying to listen to you for sure. Um, When you said you're reading like the Hebrew, like what do you mean? You're reading an actual, like kind of more of a literal Hebrew translation. Yeah, I just do a side translation because I was thinking, what should I do? Just go to Nuke and James. But, you know, since you've asked me to read. A Hebrew uh, translation. That's pretty cool. I I really love how it said in verse 8 that God was just taking a stroll. Yeah, that's... Um, I'm glad you picked it up because uh, it's just the form of this verb is not just he was going somewhere, you know, because like if you say I go, it's like, where do you go? I mean, I go shopping. Yeah. But uh, here is he was definitely like taking a stroll and he wanted his company uh, Adam, at least, or or Adam and Eve, he wanted to have a st- walk with him, you know, stroll yeah. around the garden. But they were nowhere to be found. They were nowhere to be found. And it's very interesting how, um, you know, we hear a lot of commentary on this question. Well, probably not enough commentary. This question that God asks Adam and Eve, and I actually just read the other day um, in a rabbinic commentary that this is the shortest question in the Torah in all first five books of the Bible. Very interesting. And you'll help us dive into that soon. But when God says, where are you? Typically, like the commentary that I hear is God was wanting Adam and Eve to understand their sin and to recognize what they had done. And then they just leave it there. And like, obviously, since God's all powerful, he obviously knew their physical location. And yeah, sure, he wanted them to be in tune with the reality of what they had done and where they are spiritually and all of that. But I just feel like the way that we talk about it is almost like God was being passive aggressive, like passive aggressive, like, like, yeah, what do you think you did? Like, look at you now, almost. I've always interpreted it as, and this is how I always, it's like when the mom walks into the living room and the kid has like cookie, like chocolate all Uh over their face. And they're like, Uh did you have a cookie? Uh-huh. And they're like, no, mm. I didn't have a cookie. I'm like, no, you didn't. Really? Mm. <laughs> like, are you sure you didn't have a cookie? Like, God's kind of waiting for them to acknowledge what they've done wrong. Sure. And that's his way of doing it is just yeah. asking the question. Exactly. And I really like that. Um, I was trying to think this week, what could we, wh- what is similar to this question where God, where God 
asked Adam and Eve, where are you? And it really made me think of that famous viral clip on IGTV where the British uh, journalist, um, Tom Bradby, famously asked Meghan Markle if she was okay. And um, really, he, he really didn't even ask it like that. He just checked in and he was like, so like with all the busyness that you've been going through, um, and you have a newborn and you're a newlywed, like, how have you been doing with all of this? And w- if you watch the clip, you kind of just see her like she was surprised and she kind of like puts back her head a little bit and she smiles and she's like, um, wow, like, thanks for asking that because not many people have taken the time to, not many people have asked me if I'm okay. This is, this is kind of interesting uh, uh, because uh, uh, we have a kind of definition of a person who is, uh, I don't know the best word, but the, like a boring person yeah. who is that kind of, you know, uh, like, uh, like we have a good Yiddish word. I don't know if you remember that. The word nudnik. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I actually don't. I've never heard of that one. You know, it's, it's kind of a hard to, <laughs> to present this concept, but somebody who is really boring, he's talking long, like da, 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 all kinds of stuff. Anyway, they call him in Yiddish nudnik. Uh, so, so the, the, the definition of nudnik is uh, if you ask nudnik, who, how are you? He actually is going to stand on the street and explain in little details how is he. And of course, <laughs> nobody likes that. <laughs> oh, right. Well, thankfully, Megan was quite, you know, distinct and short in her answer. But the, I think the bigger question here is, like, was God asking where, you, where are you just to ch- for him to check his spiritual state? Or, God forbid, dare I say it, was God just actually also asking Adam if he was okay? Well, I was, I, I kind of like where, where you went with this because, uh, you know, this question, like asking about how are you, it's a sort of hello, mm-hmm. right? But yeah. there is another how are like, you. Like how are you? And, and when somebody actually genuinely asks that question, what goes through your mind? Well, uh, like when you know they're ready to listen. We typically start thinking like when we know we're in a safe place and the person is actually going to listen. And I think even in that clip with Megan and Tom Bradby, you could see the dynamics between them. Megan felt safe with Tom and she started opening up and she's, and she's like, yeah, actually I'm not okay. And we start thinking about the things in our life and it actually gets into those spiritual aspects of actually I've been too busy to spend time with God. Actually, I've been so busy that I haven't even spent time with my kids this week. Actually, I've been struggling with depression. Actually, I have so much, and I just feel like God and Adam were having this exchange where God wanted, God, he knew that Adam knew the consequence. I don't think he was just checking up on Adam just so that Adam would recognize his sin, but because he was genuinely concerned for his, his emotional state, which is why one of the reasons God did something special for him. What did he do? Well, when I was listening to you presenting uh, first the churchy position, uh, what God wanted is uh, to Adam for for Adam to explain his sin and acknowledge it uh, to Meghan Markle, uh, which is kind of very modern, you know. And it's interesting how we sometimes reading uh, the Bible from the position of uh, only today's reality. And uh, uh, you know, as a Bible scholar, I always look at the biblical reality <laughs> through the eyes of okay. the original text. Enlighten us then. Yeah. Uh, is the, so basically what I feel like he's getting at is the, the legalistic form that people usually interpret from the church is we don't want to swing the pendulum all the way to the emotional side and people forget what that medial, middle ground is where there is, there are, there's an, a legalistic interpretation that gives the guidelines and the boundaries and all these other things that the God's trying to get to without going into the straight that God's just an emotional being that's only focusing on how God is feeling at the time and not acknowledging what he's done wrong. Okay. So because uh, when we go beyond just how are you in the text, uh, we see uh, not only about how are you doing, but there is a more to it. And that's how, uh, you know, when you ask me, uh, Sasha, 
give us something. You, yesterday you called me, Sasha, give us something from a rabbinic perspective. And I was like, what the rabbinic perspective could be? I kind of began to read today, and I discovered this interesting spelling, which rabbis actually love to pick on word spellings. So the way how this where are you is spelled, ayecha, can mean two different things. And they're very uh, similar uh, because on the one hand, it's ayecha, where are you? So I is where, and then you have ha, which means are you? And then you have also, uh, it can be read as eicha, which means how. And of course, uh, in, in English, it doesn't make much sense when I say just how, because then what exactly you need something to supply like what are you referencing yeah, yeah. how are you or how it happened but uh, this eha it's it's a very emotional statement it's not just a question it's a very emotional statement so you're saying it's both a statement and a question that god was at, god was expressing yes it's okay. both a statement and it's a question because eha is the it's the title it's a, it's a Hebrew title of the book Lamentation, and Lamentation is uh, when when it was written it's a supposed to cry. So wait, when, what? what? It's <laughs> supposed you know Lamentation is uh, you know when somebody. But you said the title of Lamentations. Yeah, that the, in in English it's Lamentation. It's he, in Hebrew it's Echa. Echa meaning oh. how. Oh, it's so okay. So, uh, it's, Pastor it's, Sasha, did you just tell us that God's question to Adam and Eve is the title of Lamentations? The same. It's just, it's it's. It, if you look, mind at, blown. Yeah, if you look at the text, you know I will be okay. Too, so then, you know, so then, what? It, so you have all of us on the edge of our seats now. So give us the uh, the core definition of Aecha. Where are you? Like, what was God getting at? So. God wasn't just asking Adam, you know, where are you? Like he didn't know where he was. God was asking, how? Meaning how it actually happened. How? It's like, it's something tragic. You know, it's Jeremiah sees the ruins of his hometown burned down, women raped. Uh, you know, this is mm -hmm. all this uh, picture of the ancient invasion, ancient Near Eastern, uh, plundered. Uh, the, the, the captives are lined up. But do you think, and, and I, I love that, I love that picture you, you painted. But do you also think that when God asked Adam and Eve, um, I, I like just saying, Eiecha. am I saying it right? Eiecha? You can, yeah. It's in, Eiecha. It's, yeah. Okay. So, so you can, uh, the way how it can be read, and it's basically can be read as eha, which means how, and it's this kind of exclamation before your tears are going to float from your eyes. This is like, some like a shock, like imagine yourself, uh, you know, just uh, you driving uh, on the road, not suspecting anything, uh, and then your loved one uh, is driving somewhere, you don't know where, and then you pass by, you see a scene of a car accident, really terrible car accident, and you look that. into the, uh, uh, you stop, and you look, and you see it's your loved one in that seat. Yes. And it's like, you, you see, it's, it, it yes. hits you like a freight. Like, how did this right. happen? Like, how did this happen? Like, I want like I want to know, like, how did this happen? But also, like, how are you? Like, and what we know from God's character all throughout Scripture is not just about, you need to know what led you to be this way so that you can get right with me, son. It's more than that. It's also like, I love you so much. Like, I don't want to see you hurt. I don't want to be separated so, from you. So it's not like God is, it's, it, it, God wasn't like trying to immediately seek his judgment over Adam, but he was actually distraught himself. Exactly, so, exactly. So what I'm gathering is like, God's out, God's out taking a stroll through the garden. And comes across Adam. He knows he's come across Adam because he knows where Adam is. But so now he's 
through the interpretation of the original text, he's actually saying, he's ask, asking Adam, how did you become, how did you get to be the way you are right now? Because he knows the difference between, he knows they've eaten, they know there's a change in Adam and Eve. So he's asking Adam specifically, how did you get to be the way you are currently? Is yeah, that, that- so, so this how are you, it's, uh, it's not just, uh, the question uh, of curiosity here, where, where are you? It's not a matter of curiosity. Uh, it's the matter like when you know, like let's say you know some, again, talking about some loved one, and you see, you walk into the room, mm-hmm. you know, your loved one is alive, but you see a face different. And you immediately, you immediately, pee. what happened? How, you know, so. I think it's the, I think the reason why it's so important um, I love this conversation because I don't feel like we talk enough about this question at church because I feel like if we did, the reason why it's so important is because God didn't just ask this to Adam and Eve. He's asking it of us today. And this whole Sabbath school lesson is all about mission, right? Us reaching out to others, us helping others, us witnessing to others, us taking care of others. But we all know that we can't take care of others and we can't witness to others and we can't reach out when we're not taking care of ourselves. And part of taking care of ourselves is understanding that relationship that God has with us, that God wants to check in with us like he checked in with Adam and Eve on a daily basis. Like, where are you? And I feel like one of the ways that we as a church can help God, so to speak, or can, 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 can partner with God in that, how are you process? Because actually you confirmed that what Tom Bradby asked Mar- Megan Markle, like to some degree, he used the word how, right? Mm-hmm. It's not just where are you? It's how are you? How did this happen? But also like, it, like you said, God was distraught and he cared for his son. How are you also like this whole process? And, and so my point is, is like, I just feel like for us to actually do mission today is very challenging because I don't know about you, but for me, I sometimes feel like I'm walking around in a daze. I think Americans especially are so overly busy. Um, it's hard to think about witnessing. It's hard to think about um, church. It's hard to think about, you know, reaching out and using our personal time because our time is so overtaken. And I feel like I'm not sure the church is positioning itself today to really help us check in with ourselves. Like, do you feel our church um, does a good job with helping people feel safe to check in, not only check in with themselves, but to actually talk about it? I think the church in general has a hard time. Like the church and church members are very, it's a very, I don't know if it's Minnesota. I don't know if it's the church in general, but they have a hard time in my experience um, checking in with each other. And then once they find out they're struggling with something, now where do you go to help them? how do you take that next step to give them like God gave them or like, okay, now that you're in this situation, Mm -hmm. God gave the God clothed them. Mm -hmm. God gave them these things. Okay. Now you're in a hard position. Like it's kind of your fault, but what can I do to help you now? So now how do we do this in the church where, okay, well, Bill is going through something tough, going through divorce, going through children's hospital, whatever you name the thing. Now, what do we do the next next step to do the thing that God did for everyone else, which is clothe them, help them, serve them. How do we do that with each other? I think we have a hard time with that. That's deep. Um, Do you feel like people in our neighborhood think our church is equipped to help them? No. (laughs) In that regard? (laughs) No. no. And I don't think it's just our church. I think there's a lot of churches in the area. Like, so it's not, it's not um, Adventist in general or or specifically. I think a lot of churches have a hard time um, knowing how to serve each other and knowing how to do that. Yeah. That, that's a very good point, Eric, because uh, from the practical perspective, uh, you know, being, uh, I started as evangelist, uh, our good friend and uh, boss, we can say, Ralph Ringer, uh, I know him for more than uh, 30 years and he taught me evangelism. That's what is in my blood. But uh, working, especially when I came to North America, uh, I've discovered that uh, if there is no 
church that can be placed where these people whom we just explain the nice prophecies and stuff like this, which I love to explain. But if there is no church that is functional for them to come to, uh, this is very difficult yeah, to fulfill the mission. Totally. And I think a large part of it is because the members of the church, me, myself, we're not asking ourselves what God asked Adam and Eve. Like, how did I get so busy? How is my life so overly consumed that I'm only spending 20 minutes a day with my kids? How is my life so overly consumed that I'm not spending that time with God that I know I need to have to feel the confidence that I need to reach out? And I feel like um, when God asked Adam, how did this happen? It wasn't only to recon- help start, start that process of reconciling Adam to himself, but it was to also help Adam. And I was just thinking like this week, like, I don't, I don't know about you guys, but like when I'm not checking in with myself and asking myself, how did I get here? Um, it develops this insecurity in me, this this anxiety. And with the, like the whole world is going through this anxiety epidemic. And I feel like it's because we're not being communal enough. We're not checking in with each other. We're not asking each other, like, how are you? And not just how are you, but like that, the, in the all encompassing way that God asked it. Uh, it's yeah. interesting. Uh, again, uh, I came to America more than 20 years ago and I discovered one interesting concept, uh, uh, especially American concept. I don't know. I don't know about British uh, on this, but American for sure. It's a concept of relationships. Mm-hmm. Because, uh, and, and at some point as a scholar, I began to uh, think uh, about, you know, how is this concept of relationships uh, actually uh, presented in, in Hebrew? Because I began to, you know, looked at modern Hebrew, and of course it made no sense. I mean, there is a word for that, but it makes no sense. So I began to look more carefully, and I discovered that relationships in the biblical Hebrew is described like walking together. So taking a stroll together. And we have this throughout the book of Genesis. Uh, the same word which God, uh, which describes God taking a stroll in the Garden of Eden, looking for Adam, is, uh, is described with Enoch. And it says in English, Enoch walked with God or before God. And it's like, what's that? What does it mean? And actually, if we take it straight from the uh, grammatical perspective, Enoch was taking a stroll with God, which is, this is how relationship mm-hmm. is. And But we're not strolling with each other. We're strolling with each other on Instagram. And I think that's why, I mean, sure, Instagram can be helpful, but it's overtaken our social lives to the point where like, there's only to so much degree to where like, I can ask Eric on Facebook, like, dude, how are you doing today? Like he can't, if he's really going through a hard time, like how much can he say right there in a public comment or even in a private message? Like you can go somewhere with that, but we're missing that real, like God was walking with them in the garden, that real life, physical touch. We're not, we don't, we lack that today. So speaking of touch, Sasha, I've just been dying to ask you this question. I, I'm dying to get into, uh, diving into this lesson this week has been really good for me because it made me realize how much I don't know about this story, but I feel like there's some more depth to God going to make those clothes. I love that the Bible says he actually, I don't remember the word exact words, but it said that he made them, right? He made them tunics and he goes and he clothes them. Can, can you read that for us? And I'm, I'm really dying to ask you some questions about this. Well, this is on 321. Uh, basically on 321, just very simple uh, text. And the Lord God make for Adam yeah. and his wife, uh, like uh, tunics, uh, of uh, uh, skin or leather and uh, made them uh, wear it. And made them wear it, okay. So did, did God make them wear it because God was uncomfortable being around them naked? That's a good question. And I'm glad that you asked <laughs> specifically because um, 
it, go, it brings back to what I spoke about the relationship. So we need to go back into some Hebrew word puns. Okay. Because unlike English word puns used for jokes, Hebrew word puns are used to to make drive a special spiritual and theological point. Okay, I'm trying to wrap my brain around. Did you just dive into the area of puns? Yes. Okay. P-U-N's, yes, yes, Okay, yes. where are you taking us? So, here's what happens. So, God asks Adam, not just where are you, but how? So, he's distraught. It's like, yeah. it's just, God is about to cry. God is about to to lump, to to uh, to really lament over what happened, uh, because what God mm. is after, He's seeking Adam's answer, and here is the answer which God. This is this is the crux of the whole matter. Of what the issue? It's not about disobedience. You know, that's that's what you refer, to, Eric. Legalism, oh, it's just mm-hmm. disobedience. It's not about disobedience. Uh, it is actually, by the way, more about emotions. So, really? Yes. Oh gosh, I feel so validated. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because here is what Adam says. Uh, uh, it's, it's he says, I s- heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. So here's a pun. So the word erom here, mm-hmm. naked, is the same as a description of the uh, serpent. It says in the uh, original, uh, serpent was erom, among all the uh, naked, or so you're saying the word "erom" means what? Both naked, and then it can mean also if it's spelled without, you know, the, the same spelling. I actually can mean cunning or crafty. Okay, cunning, crafty, and naked. Yeah, it's it's basically <laughs> that's random. It's basically the same spelling because again, I'm, okay. I mean, there's words in English that we use for different things. But you see so, the connection here. That's that's the yeah, thing. That's where I'm getting. Like, where, where's the connection? Why would you use that word to explain both things? Uh, because what the word "erom" describes is very unusual word uh, here to describe the character of the of the serpent. So here is something that the uh, that Moses particularly, you know, is, is emphasizing. There's something changed inside. Something changed inside. And, and what the result is, he knows that he is a Rome. Okay. And he is afraid. And this is the key emotion. Why suddenly you afraid? It's like the, the little baby, when, when, when the baby is born uh, out of the womb, and uh, I had experience of holding my son just born he's not afraid of me but what i discovered very interestingly uh, when children are small like babies and even toddlers they're not going to be afraid of mommy and daddy they're going to be afraid of strangers many would but mommy and daddy not so adam is afraid suddenly so what, I mean, he's hiding from God. So basically what he says to God is not just he's hiding. He's saying, what ha- I, I discovered, God, you're a stranger to me. And that's it. So he treats God not as his father creator, but a stranger because now he is afraid. You're not supposed to be afraid of someone who is close to you. But if he has this emotion of fear. Okay, so so are you saying then that God created the, he made the clothes for Adam and Eve, not because he needed it, but because they needed it. They want, I guess my point is, is just because today, I don't know, um, 
we don't talk a lot about, you know, sex and nakedness in church, but, you know, the, the old age tradition of Christianity and nakedness is, oh, you know, like very separate. And, well, and I look just... And it, you have to... The, in, the, uh, in the Middle Eastern culture, you know, the, the nakedness is totally different. Uh, you know, it, it, the word naked in the West, uh, uh, you know, yeah, some, somebody is uh, taking a sun bath on the Santa Monica beach uh, in bikini is not naked. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. Right. But uh, in the Middle East, if you're just wearing a normal summer clothes, like tank top and, sh- and, and shorts, you are in the I guess naked. what I'm trying to ask is like, This morning when I was reading this passage, I was thinking like to really understand the reason God gave them the clothes. I just wish I understood more about God's relationship to nakedness in scripture. Uh, Well, first of all, there are many uh, aspects of nakedness because the word uh, nakedness is used in the book of Leviticus uh, referring to uh, sexual intercourse. And of course, this is not the case here. Although we have, uh, you know, when we go to some biblical terminology like covenant, uh, and the, the covenant is basically uh, in the Bible is uh, always described in poetic language as a marriage ceremony. Mm-hmm. Although uh, it's, it's to illustrate the closeness of relationship. Uh, this is why... Uh, to me, when I look at the text and I see this Arom here and, and he gave him a clothes and, and some commentators go and they say, oh, they had the uh, clothes made of light and we don't have this in the text. I don't like to speculate beyond what the Bible text uh, says sure. to me. And so we do not know In what sense, uh, the Bible doesn't spell out to us in what sense Adam and Eve... uh, But we do have a lot of symbolism of clothes in Scripture. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, There is is plenty. You're right. There is... uh, And I I just wonder, um, would it be exegetically correct, if that's the right term, to... Like, like for example, in Job... um, in, in Job, uh, I think it was Job twenty nine fourteen. Yeah, I put on righteousness as my clothing. Um, justice was my robe and my turban. It's just interesting that the people back then um, uh, linked clothing with righteousness. Um, yes, it's it's the pretty much old uh, terminology. But on the other hand. This is what I begin to think about. Uh, again, this is that this chapter is about relationship because okay. uh, you know every theologian and pastor and preacher would agree that uh, the fall, which is described in uh, Genesis uh, chapter three, it's basically a breakup of relationship. It's a broken relationship mm-hmm. between. Uh, man and God. Right. So, did the clothing symbolize anything, or was God just purely one? This is this is what I am thinking, actually, when it comes to clothing. Eric, you want? So, what I'm thinking is, and this is just my interpretation, because, and I always relate it back to relationships, because we are talking about relationship, God's relationship with with Adam and Eve. So, there's times when. Children, like I've always heard, my parents have always said it. When your kids are making noise, that's not the problem. When they get quiet, then you're, then there's a problem. Exactly. So then that's where you get where Adam and Eve are hiding. So now they're being quiet. So <laughs> now when you have, when you get to the point where the kid is not necessarily, they've done something wrong, so now they're hiding from you. So, but the, you want them you don't want them to do something wrong. When they're in trouble, when they're doing something wrong, you don't want them to hide from you. Or they don't want right. you to hide you mm-hmm. want them to come to you. Mm-hmm. So, mm. and at that point, and that does happen, that's a relationship between parents and children that happens mm. all the time. Any, I think most parents would relate to that. Yeah. So in order to get the, have your child feel comfortable enough to come to you with the things mm-hmm. that are, you're having issues with or whatever they're having mm. issues with, you do the thing for them that makes them feel comfortable. And in this particular case, God clothed them mm-hmm. because it was, they were feeling uncomfortable. So mm-hmm. God gave them the clothes. God gave them something mm. that connects them mm-hmm. and makes them feel comfortable to come yeah. out and talk to him again. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, and uh, uh, answering that the question, uh, I like... Uh, 
not like Job, you know, oh, he gave them righteousness right away. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's more of a poetic here. Uh, the book of Genesis uh, is not a poetic book. I wouldn't use poetic imagery here to interpret the clothes here. But what I would go for is uh, I would go. So it's more practical, like w- no, on what it's, Eric it's is saying. More, uh, yes, in a way. Mm-hmm. Let me let me confirm uh, this by the book of Ezekiel. There is a very interesting imagery used here in Ezekiel chapter sixteen when God is talking about Israel and how it's described here. The Israel is described like this, uh, and maybe it's a hard concept to picture, but I'll try to explain quickly. Uh, in Ezekiel 16, verse 4, it says, As for your nativity, on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed in the water to cleanse you. You were not wrapped with the salt, nor wrapped in a swaddling cloth. So here is the baby girl. Like what, what the picture is, it's a picture of like uh, old Arabian nomads who uh, basically didn't like uh, too many baby girls born. So when a baby girl is born, they just, you know, as soon as they came out of the womb, they even didn't cut the umbilical cord. They would wait until, you know, everything is, ex, uh, you know, expelled. And then they would just pull it out and just throw her into the sand just to die. It's it's horrible, gruesome scene. But it shows absolutely helplessness. And so... Adam was like this. When Adam broke the relationship with God, he realized he has nothing. You know, his his character suddenly changes, mimicking the character of uh, of the uh, serpent. Because serpent promised them something better out of this fruit. But it came on the it came the opposite. The result was the opposite. Adam feels he is, on the one hand, having the same traits of character like the uh, serpent has. And on the other hand, because this word has two meanings, he feels like he is helpless and he doesn't trust anybody. So he forgot how to trust. He is afraid of his maker and he is helpless. And so where God in this case? So here's what God does with... uh, with Israel, who is absolutely helpful. It says here, I spread my wing over you and covered your nakedness. It's not a bird. Yeah, and what is he trying to tell them there? It's not a bird wing. Uh, There is this, what people know as a prayer shawl. It also has uh, edges, it has a wing. So he basically, it's like a big thing. He wrapped her like this. So this is what Adam needs. So this, this is the reaction of God. He's not just kicking them out. In fact, it says, I swore an oath to you and enter into the covenant with you and you became mine. So, the so God re- is wanting to do whatever it takes for them to stay close. And like God, Eric said, da, yeah. make them feel comfortable and also just bridge the divide. Yeah, he is making the covenant. He is building the relationship. But of course, it's a different relationship because something changed instead of inside Adam. And this is, you know... There are- okay, so what would you say represents our nakedness today? And what would you say, and is it a correct question to ask, is God offering us today clothes like he offered Adam and Eve to make us feel comfortable and safe in his presence? Absolutely. Because we feel very unsafe. We feel very unsafe. We, uh, we need... When when we are able, especially in American culture, I discovered with the question, how are you? People, when they ask you, and very often in a church, how are you? How are you? How are you? And it's just, they, the expectation is to have yeah, I'm fine. fine. I'm mm-hmm. fine. But you have to be really, really comfortable and secure to be able to tell how you really how are. really are. But Adam, it was Adam's problem that he was insecure with God. Mm-hmm. It wasn't God's problem. 
It was Adam's fault. There was no indication besides like God says. So how can we feel secure today? And, and, and what contributes to us feeling naked today? Well, in my opinion as a pastor, I see many people come into church uh, who feel emotionally uh, insecure uh, because I don't, I, I don't fully understand why uh, is it that way here in this time and this place, but I've seen it. I've seen more of it in uh, like Pacific Northwest, <laughs> but it's, it's, there's plenty of emotional insecurity. Everybody's insecure. I mean, but some people struggle with it more than others. And I think it's just a result of like living in a sinful world and just the brokenness of everything, our families, our lives, just everything. Anything can contribute to insecurity. But our, our, and so I guess, are you, are you kind of saying that that's kind of our, our yeah, nakedness that, today? Because that's what he felt. He felt insecure because he was naked. Yeah, yeah. And I think maybe... It's, 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 you know, if I, I don't want our viewers to see me trying to interpret it like allegorically, but and because again, we don't know exactly to which for what. I, all I know is that when we do wrong today, consciously or subconsciously, it strips us of our identities. It strips us of our confidence. It strips us of, of feeling secure in life because we know we messed up. And so God gave these physical clothes to Adam and Eve to help them to be able to be more spiritually prepared to come to him. Um, but on the other hand here, it's very, very interesting because when we go back to uh, chapter two, the last thing, look at this. So, therefore man shall live, I'm reading just from Nick and James, uh, his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. So what I see here, it's not like they were running around uh, with their genitals exposed, sorry for my <laughs> <laughs> graphic language, but it says it's connected with one flesh. So they were secured. Uh, in other words, uh, if we're talking like even, uh, again, mm. sorry, but uh, a good spousal intimate relationship happens when both feel secure and trust each yeah. other. Yeah. Uh, and so this is why we have this line here that they were naked and they were not ashamed. They felt secure with each other. I guess what I'm trying to tap into is can we tap into the security that God offered Adam and Eve. Of course, you know. So, and and so how do we do that? Yeah, so basically, th they came from the verse two when mm -hmm. they're happy couple loving each other, mm -hmm. secure with each other. So, so love provides security. Yeah. That's, that's the main thing. Love provides security. Uh, a baby is not afraid of his loving parents. Uh, a husband and wife are not ashamed of each other in the bed because they feel secure and they can... And of course, one thing how you know secure with adults is can you talk about everything or there is something which you're not able to talk about. So God is providing a security. Uh, I, I give you this. Chernobyl, right? This toxic reactor is going to be toxic uh, until the end of the world. There's nothing we can do about it. There's no way to repair it. So what the engineers uh, came up with, they created a sarcophagus, some kind of a dome made of a country to protect. So in, God is providing that kind of security because uh, the Satan through the deceit brought in toxicity in our character. And so God gave Adam and Eve clothes to help them to, to mitigate that toxicity. And so the only way for us to get that is to believe that God is not going to let us down. So God did not through Adam and Eve out of garden and of Eden like some uh, some bad person throws the cat out of you know like 
he didn't do like this. He, he was actually doing what needs to be done in a situation where Adam and Eve got themselves into. Mm -hmm. Well, see, and then my question is always going to come back to kind of what you were talking about earlier. Is how, how do we bring the, how do we get to the church and the relationships within the church, not just the relationship with God, but the relationships within the church to the comfortable, comfortable to the point where other people in the church feel comfortable coming to us to talk about the things that are that they're struggling with. Mm. And how do we bridge that gap between not just our relationship with us and God, but our relationships with each other? Because that's what's going to build the church. That's what's going to bring people into the church mm. is that connection, in my opinion, to each other that they know that they can count on us to be there to help them, to clothe what them. What do you to think? Work. What do you What's going to do that? Yeah, what do you well, think? We find ourselves in this weird catch-22, I think. We have... Uh, we live such busy lives that we feel like we don't have time to even help each other, but we're not going to build the relationships unless we spend that time with each other. Mm -hmm. Not just doing things like barbecues and like bonfires. It's can we count on each other to help our help each other through things mm -hmm. like God was there to help clothe that. Mm -hmm. So if we can't find a way to help each other and to bridge that gap in relationships with each other, then like again back to the that's that's in my opinion that's how god helped bridge that gap we're all going to be wake, walking around we're, naked and afraid yeah we're all naked and afraid trying to figure out how to how to get and to, helpless and helpless yeah. and how to get to how to get to the end goal by ourselves with just us and god and god doesn't want us walking alone yeah. he wants us walking with each other yeah. as a community as a community yeah, that's really deep, and I really like what you said about making sure that people see the church as a safe place. Thank you so much, Eric. And thank you, Pastor Sasha. Thank you guys so much for watching this show and just joining with us in, to, in this discussion. This is how we get closer to each other and understand each other better and are more prepared to help our neighbor. Um, if you like this video, please like it and subscribe, and we will see you next Sabbath.